And we are live. Yay. Yay, we can do it. Uh, mm -hmm. Hello, all humans. Welcome. Uh, I am Ron Russell, Program Director here at HSGP, and welcome to the 10th uh, Digital Sunday Speaker. I'm going to quit counting at this point. So, <laughs> just so everyone knows, uh, we'll continue to provide content digitally until we can gather together again. Uh, if anyone has any content or wants to contribute content to us, uh, please see myself, any of the other directors, uh, and that will make its way to us. Uh, and for those of you who are submitting Sunday speaker suggestions via the HSGP website, thank you, thank you, thank you. Please keep submitting them and keep them coming. Uh, as always, stay muted unless you are actively speaking. Uh, don't be offended if I mute you due to background noise. Uh, uh, not quite sure how the Q&A is going to happen, but uh, raise your hand. Uh, we can uh, uh, ask and answer questions if you type them. Share the air. Practice the 10 commitments of humanism. Hal, I'm going to mute you. Muted. <laughs> Don't be offended if I mute you. Uh, share the air, practice 10 commitments of humanism, and after the recording stops, hang out and catch up. Uh, we do have a board meeting after. Um, more than welcome to uh, hang out and be there for that. Uh, with that, I'm going to pass this over to Luke and then Alex, and then we will get into uh, announcements and the presentation. So kick us off, Luke. Good morning, everyone. My name is Luke Douglas. I'm the executive director of the Humanist Society of Greater Phoenix. HSGP is a warm and welcoming community of humanists that is proud to be celebrating 50 years since our founding in 1970. We have come an incredibly long way from meeting in restaurants, meeting at the uh, Old Town Buffet, it was, mm -hmm. uh, for many, many years that it took to get us to this point where we had, have a building of our own. We have dedicated team of volunteers and staff to make this home a, a place for everyone and a place that will make our wider community a better place. As you know, from my announcement last time, we received a grant to renovate our children's room, which is now starting uh, to, to take shape. We are pulling our plans together to decide what exactly we're gonna do with these funds to make our children's room better and our children's program, a more welcoming place that will continue attracting more young families with kids who can add some life and vibrancy and energy to our community and provide volunteer opportunities for anybody who wants to be a part of making our children's program a newer and more welcoming place. Uh, just another example of opportunities that are made possible by your support, your time, your talent, and your treasure. The Maricopa County Juvenile Probation Department reached out to us as they reached out to several nonprofits in the community and asked if we would be listed as a place where uh, juvenile offenders could serve out their court ordered volunteer hours. So I've been working with Howard, our facilities manager to be able to uh, manage some volunteers from the community who may not have transportation, who may just need something that's close in their community and we can, we can help, we can teach life skills, teach how to use a pressure washer, teach how to um, maintain the facility and be there to help them get the hours they need and also get some good life skills along the way. So these are all exciting developments that we're seeing. They're made possible by your contributions and support. So please don't forget us as we move through this time and hope for a time soon when we can meet in person once again. And that being said, I think it's we're ready for Alex's updates. Good morning, everybody. My name is Alex Zygmunt. I am the president of the Humanist Society of Greater Phoenix. It is wonderful to see everybody here this morning. Uh, lots of smiling faces. I really wish we could see, see each other in person, but for now, that's on hold, unfortunately. But as a president, president's update, uh, as mentioned last Sunday speaker meeting, uh, our treasurer, Carol, uh, is not going to be returning for 2021. So we are now actively looking for a treasurer, someone who has either either now holds a, a CPA or is a bookkeeper of some sort or someone who has experience uh, running the treasurer position. Please reach out to me. Uh, this is something that is vital to this community. Uh, as you know, 
even though we're a nonprofit, it still takes money to run some of our programs, the building itself, our community center. So these are vitally important roles within the community. Please reach out to me. I'd love to talk to you, see what we can do to keep moving forward. Um, that being said, we do have a board meeting this afternoon. We're going to be talking about a couple of things. Um, the one of which is the Arizona uh, uh, Faith Network. Um, Luke has been working with them for a little bit. Uh, no, Ron's been also working with them. So there are a lot of things that are going around in the background. Stick around for the board meeting if you would like to contribute to your, uh, or even just find out how the sausage is made. So. At that, I'm just going to make it really short today. Say thank you all for being in attendance. And if you're watching on YouTube, hit that subscribe button. It helps, please. Thank you, Alex. Thank you. Uh, and now I'll go over some uh, schedule changes and new events and past events. Uh, so on August 14th, we had the Humanities Project, uh, History, the Truth About the Confederacy in the United States. Mm -hmm. On August 15th, Secular AZ had Lindsay Love, Chandler Unified School Board member, The Trap of Politeness. Uh, we just finished up a four-week program on Becoming Anti-Racist, a workshop for white people. Uh, the blood drive, uh, we got metrics back from the blood drive that we had on August 8th. Uh, we had 20 slots, we had 18 pints that were collected, and six of the 20 were new donors, uh, which the uh, American Red Cross sees as a huge success. Um, AHA did the Distant But Together Digital Conference and uh, the Congressional Free Thought Caucus had a uh, session uh, where Athena Solomon represented Arizona beautifully. Uh, events online, we still have the Coffee Social and Humanist Meditations on Saturday. Uh, August 8th through 5th, we have another workshop on becoming anti-racist, a workshop for white people, so you want to talk about race. Uh, August 29th, we have Secular AZ Mark Nissi of Kingman Freethinkers, uh, a secular community in Mojave Counter in Mojave County. Uh, September 11th, we have the Humanities Project, a Limerick Contest. Uh, September 13th, we have community speakers. There's about two slots left. So if you have something that you're passionate about that relates to humanism or our work here in Arizona, uh, reach out to myself or Mars and pick up one of those last two slots. In October, we have Nick Fish of American Atheists and our Flying Spaghetti Monster dinner, which is going to look a little different this year. <laughs> uh, September 19th, we have an intersexual book study. And on the September 20th we have leaving religion. Okay, so we are in, we are in. so uh are yep oh, good. Okay. hang on i'm going to mute you thank you uh and so uh since we are doing the uh history of hsgp we're going to skip the humanist minute i'm going to go right into um the the break hello all you humans Welcome to the Humanist Society of Greater Phoenix Digital Sunday Speaker Event. I'm Ron Russell, Program Director here at HSGP. If you like our content, please smash the subscribe button. No, really, press the subscribe button. It helps a lot. Uh, if you want to contribute in a more material way to HSGP, please become a member, donate to our Patreon account, or volunteer. Today, we have Susan Sackett and Hal Safferstein for some history and a discussion around HSGP in our community. And with that, I would like to pass it over to Jennifer. Jennifer. Hey everybody, it's so great to see you here. Before we move on, I just wanna say a couple of things about two upcoming events real briefly. Um, the Limerick Contest, this our humanities project uh, thing that's coming up. The, we're, it's a Limericks contest. Also, if you don't enter the contest, please come uh, uh, to the event anyway. It's a second Friday in September to hear limericks, share limericks. Uh, but those who are entering the contest, the due date to, for Zenaido to receive your limericks um, is the 28th of August. So I just wanna make sure I let you know that, just send them to zenaido at aol.com so you can be in the contest. The other brief thing is I'm repeating, we're repeating the, um, as Ron said, the so you wanna be, uh, so becoming anti-racist, workshop for white people, we're, we're doing it again with the same book for five weeks starting um, on Tuesdays at 6 p.m. to 7.30. So we're doing it a little bit later to catch people who couldn't make it to make it last time. Um, and I have one 
extra copy of the book that we're using, that we're being led by, called So You Want to Talk About Race by Ijioma Oluo. And I would like to give this book to somebody, like the first one who like asks me for this book in the chat, I will mail it to you. So uh, let me know and I'll, and that's it for that. And um, I would like to turn it over to Zenaido to give an intro and get our program started. Okay, thank you, Jennifer. Am I, uh, can you hear me now? Okay, yeah, this is uh, Zenaido Quintana. I am the uh, chair of the Circuit Coalition for Arizona and a member of the Humanist Society. And uh, as Luke mentioned earlier, uh, this year marks the 50th anniversary of the founding of the organization that evolved into the Humanist Society of Greater Phoenix. It's also the 10th anniversary of the opening of the permanent home of the Humanist Society, the country's first wholly owned humanist community center. Today, we will be interviewing the two individuals who played seminal roles in this truly historic accomplishment. In a future program, we hope to bring you some of the other key players whose contributions helped make the center what it has become today. About 20 years ago, the paths of two remarkable individuals crossed in a restaurant in Chandler, Arizona. One was there as the president of an itinerant community of humanists with no fixed abode. The other, a recently retired dermatologist and transplant to Arizona in search of an entertaining presentation from a political cartoonist. These two people were of course, Susan Sackett, who served as president of the Humanist Society of Greater Phoenix for 10 years, and Dr. Harold Safferstein, the retired dermatologist. Today, we'll learn about them, how they came together to give us this special place that has made such a difference in our lives. And we'll start with Susan Sackett's conversation with Jennifer White. Mm -hmm. Unmute, Jennifer. Jennifer. Hi. Oh, <laughs> Hi, Susan. Hi, Jen. Where are you? There you are. Hi. Good morning. I'm so glad you could come today and talk with us and Hal too. It's going to be really great. And I will start the questions. Uh, what we're going to do is um, I'll ask two questions, then Zenaida will ask two questions. We'll go back and forth that way. So um, the first question for you, Susan, is you were born in New York City on December 18th, 1943. Uh, uh, uh. No? <laughs> yeah, no, 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 that's right. But I don't think oh. everybody needs to know how old I am. Oh, <laughs> uh, you're a young spring chicken. Yeah. <laughs> and raised in Connecticut. Right. Can you tell us something about your family? Were they religious? And what was your childhood like? Well, um, first off, I'm an adopted uh, child. I was adopted as a four month old baby. Um, and I didn't find this out until I was uh, in my late 30s when my father passed away, my father who raised me. And, um, but I had a, a wonderful childhood because I was a wanted child. I was brought up in the Reformed temple, Jewish temple. Um, I had a confirmation, which was exciting for me because everybody gave me a present, I came to the party, and I had you know, no cares whatsoever about the religious part of it. Um, but I never really thought about it until I got older. So um, I, I'm not sure what the rest of the question was, but basically that's about my family and my, my upbringing was, you know, casual. It wasn't like we prayed a lot or did any of that stuff. I think we went to synagogue for the high holidays um, and that was about it. There was really no preaching or religion going on in the house. So it was uh, fairly normal. Jennifer, you're still muted. Sorry. There you are. Okay. Um, and what was your childhood like? Uh, you know, typical normal childhood. I went to school. I uh, went to summer Girl Scout camp. Um, I, you know, I, <laughs> it was a long time ago. <laughs> I just, uh, um, it, was, it was fine. I was uh, doted upon. I was always told that, um, you know, I could be anything I wanted. My mother was a school teacher. I was kind of steered toward that. 
Although if I'd had my druthers, I wanted to be an actress, but um, you know, <laughs> somehow that didn't work out. But um, it was a normal, typical childhood, you know, just uh, preparing for college, went to the University of Florida where my parents had retired to Florida. And in those days, nobody had student debt. I mean, this is insane. Yeah. You know, you, it was $113 for a whole semester. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Anyway, that was, that was it. And then I graduated and moved to Miami where I taught school. Um, are we going too far ahead now? I mean, so let me read my question. It's I don't want to hear about all this stuff, but go ahead. It includes, it includes that. Um, okay. The question is how and when did you discover Star Trek? What uh, impressed you about it? When you thought about moving to Los Angeles after graduating from the University of Florida Gainesville and teaching at an elementary school in Miami for two years, right? Right. Uh, did you have Star Trek in the back of your mind when you did that? No. Was it a coincidence that you got a job at NBC Studios? Yes. <laughs> well, kind of. Um, I discovered Star Trek when I was uh, living in Florida. I didn't catch the first episode. I caught the second episode. What impressed me about it was that there was this man with pointy ears and nobody was paying any attention to the fact that he had pointy ears. He was just one of many diverse people. And I thought, wow, this is great. Um, but I wanted to know more about it. So I, I kept tuning in week after week. I loved science fiction. But when I moved to California, it was ever since I had been a child, I wanted to work in something to do with entertainment. I didn't know what. But my ticket was the fact that I had a teaching degree and I got hired and I taught school in Pacific Palisades, California oh. for one year. Um, and I, then I said, that's it. I'm here. I'm where I want to be. I'm going to go find a job in showbiz. And so what I did was I went around town. I, I had no skills. Um, they, they weren't looking for teachers at, at you know, studios. So um, I had uh, typing skills because I, you know, knew how to type. That was about it. I could take fast notes. I pretended I took shorthand. And in those days, that was the only entree that a, a female without any, any, background in in the business could get in and I went to all the studios they all turned me down uh, I went to NBC they did not give me a typing test which phew, you know and uh, then I I began working with the publicity department um, and one of the people there worked on Star Trek and that was about as close as I could get to it but I never got to the sets I never got to see the show in its original series so um, the Basically, I worked at NBC for um, three and a half years, and then I was uh, injured, got a whiplash accident and had to quit. Mm. But I had a good friend who worked when I was ready to go back to work. I had made a very good friend, Fred Bronson, who worked at NBC in the publicity department. And he heard that, that Gene Roddenberry was working out of his home. And I, of course, knew who that was. He was the creator of Star Trek. He was looking for someone to replace his studio secretary who for some silly reason didn't want to work for Gene Roddenberry. Um, and so I applied uh, and got hired on his birthday in 1974. Um, the rest is history. Wow. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Susan. Mm. Now let's pass okay. it back to Zanido. Yeah, now I, I, I'd like to Ask Hal, he was born across the river from uh, New York. He was born in New Jersey. And uh, as his father had before him, uh, Hal, uh, your mother was a Polish immigrant and you had what I could describe as a somewhat typical upbringing of someone born during the depression in the Eastern US. Uh, could you describe a little of your early upbringing, Hal? Did we lose Hal? Do you need to unmute Hal? Hal, do you need to unmute? Okay, now, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, again, I want to say hello to all my old friends at HSGP. Um, getting back to my childhood, I had many happy memories of my early childhood. But if truth be told, my parents did not get along well. My father was laid back and not very aggressive. My mother, who was uh, very aggressive, uh, 
put pressure on my father all the time to earn more money. And uh, he didn't actually get a good job until World War II put him in a defense plant where he made a decent living. And uh, that uh, had a big impact on our life. We were able to move to a uh, better neighborhood, a Jewish neighborhood in Newark. Uh, what was the next part of the question? Well, we, we wanted to hear a little bit about your early life, but the next question is gonna be that uh, you work your way all through grade school and also through high school. In fact, you were something of a workaholic. Tell us a little bit about your work experience after uh, you uh, started school. Well, actually it started when I was about 12 years old. Uh, my parents bought a grocery store, a small neighborhood grocery uh, near our home. And uh, I enjoyed working with my father. I became actually quite competent in the grocery. And it did very well for about a year. And then my mother sort of uh, bowed out of the grocery in anger. She was pregnant with my younger brother uh, um, who lives in Prescott now, Jeffrey. And uh, when she left the business, it went downhill very quickly. So after about another year by this time, I was 14 years old, the business went under and it was sort of given away to my uncle Harry. Uh, I then went on to work for uh, a standard style company. I was 14 years old. I ran the stock room. It was a company that did uh, home style shows and I maintained that job all through a high school and three years of college. And uh, as the, as the uh, company grew, it moved away from uh, where it started to right across the street from Lee Quack High School. That enabled me to leave school at 2.30 in the afternoon, walk across the street, punch in and work till supper time, and then come back often after supper to make sure that the next day's orders went out on time. We, we worked all day Saturday and all day Sunday and uh, there was a period of a year where I worked every day, including Christmas, Thanksgiving, New Year's, and the Jewish high holidays. Uh, I had a lot of responsibility there. And at times I had as many as 10 or more uh, boys working under my supervision. What, what was the next? I want well, to stop there. No, no, no you're, you're, you're doing well. Yeah. You're doing well, Hal. We're going to switch back and get a little okay. more uh, from Susan. Good. Uh, you need to unmute yourself, Jennifer, and come back on. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Renato. All right, Susan. Yes. Okay, in 1974, you began working as a personal secretary for Gene Roddenberry when he was between projects, as you said they say in Hollywood. <laughs> uh, and that's when, as you wrote in your book, Inside Trek, My Secret Life with, sorry, I lost put my but was Star Trek creator Gene Roddenberry, 2002, your whole life changed. Uh, he became your mentor, mentor, and correct me if I say anything wrong, and you worked closely together on several Star Trek movies and Star Trek The Next Generation. Meanwhile, you and Gene had a secret romantic relationship until his death in 1991. That is correct. That close and professional relationship, that close personal and professional relationship most likely makes you the person who knew Jane, Gene Roddenberry best during his last 17 years. What do you want people to know and remember about him? 
That's a very good question. Um, and there have been so many books, articles, whatever written about him from people who really did not know him well um, and didn't interview him and just talk to other people. And, and um, I think that the one thing people should know about him was his faith in humanity. He was a humanist. He was a futurist. He believed in the human creature. He felt that we were just taking our first steps out of infancy and we hadn't yet reached maturity as a human race, but he was very optimistic that we would someday get to that point. And I think that people need to see him as, as an optimist uh, and, a, and a brilliant man. I mean, he was a Renaissance man. He, he could do anything, just about everything. He sailed boats, he flew planes, he, he wrote, he, he didn't direct, but he produced, he um, invented things. I mean, he just, he was an all one uh, capable person. And the one thing people should realize about him was that he cared profoundly for, for humankind. That's awesome. Um, now you've written many books over the years. Some were Star Trek themes, such as Letters to Star Trek 1977 and the making of Star Trek the Motion Picture with Gene Roddenberry in 1980. And then the other books were uh, like Say Goodnight Gracie, the story of Burns and Allen with Cheryl Blythe in 1986. And You Can Be a Game Show Contestant and Win with Cheryl Blythe 1982 were also about television and movies. Is yeah. it true, true that you're a game show contestant and won? Can you tell us about how that happened and maybe about your that period of writing books? Oh, well, you want to know more about the game show book? Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, uh, most of the, at that time, it was in the early 80s, um, game shows were, were the be all and end all of television and um, there were tons of them. Uh, and our book was basically about how to get on them and how to, you know, how to dress, how to act, what to say. Um, and uh, that really has, has changed quite a bit. I mean, people enter, become contestants now by applying online, I think. Uh, in those days, you went down to the studio, you looked your best, um, you filled out forms, whatever. But um, while I was doing research, while we were doing research for this book, uh, I ended up at the offices of, um, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, Jeopardy and Wheel of Fortune and a whole bunch of others. But when I went to find out about, you know, how do you get on Jeopardy? They said, well, why don't you try out? And so I did. And so I won. And that was that. <laughs> it was a, a one-time winner. But um, in those days, instead of, um, the thousand dollar prize for coming in second on the second day they actually gave prizes so i went a round trip for two to hawaii which was not too shabby <laughs> and i think one of these is online on youtube um so that book is is really not uh, it's not up to date for today's market uh the star trek books that i wrote are still uh, they're all out of print um I have many, many copies of Inside Trek available uh, at my website, insidetrek.com, and also for Kindle on Amazon, shameless promotion here. Uh, and <laughs> um, there, someone is holding it up. Joe, Joe has my book. <laughs> Hi, Joe. And it's also available on, on, on Amazon, though. You get uh, to see lots of pictures in color. We, I think we have a copy of the hardcover or, or you know, paperback in our library, or we did, unless somebody yeah. borrowed it in the HSGP library. If we ever get back to the building, there, there's a copy there. Um, and uh, so that's basically what I'm, what I've written. Um, was that was that your major work at that time, writing books? Um, well, my major work was working with Gene, uh, and I did the book writing on the side. Kind oh, yeah, of. this was all before he passed away, huh? Right, right. I, I wrote a lot of books in the 80s, and the um, mostly in the 1980s. I've, I've done about 10 books, mostly uh, all of them actually about uh, Hollywood and show business. And um, I have a book called Hollywood Sings. It's all about the uh, Oscar songs and Oscar nominated songs. And another one is uh, Primetime Hits about the, the top TV shows, you know, over a few decades. Um, 
so that was, you know, something I did on my own time. I wrote, I wrote books. I wrote a couple of scripts for Next Generation, or co-wrote, I should say. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, that was, that was just kind of not really a hobby because it paid money. So you, I don't think you can call it that, but it was, it was just a sideline that I did. And, and um, I was very productive in those days. So, yeah. Didn't you appear on um, a Star Trek Next Generation? Oh, well, um, yeah, I was on, on in one very brief scene in an episode called The Neutral Zone. It was, um, I think it was third season, but I'm not positive. Uh, about 30 minutes into the show, uh, there's a woman in a turquoise uniform and I walk, that's me. And I walk out of the, the turbo lift and I, I turn to my right and that was my big on-screen moment and <laughs> spent the whole day getting hair and makeup for the, you know, 10 seconds. <laughs> cool. uh, yeah. yeah. Well, thank you. And Zenaida, back to you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. Uh, Hal. Yep. Meanwhile, while Susan was taking a shot at showbiz, you were starting college at Rutgers Yep. And uh, after which you went to medical school, University of Illinois in Champaign-Urbana. While you were there, your roommate uh, stoked your interest in classical music. Tell us about your med school experience and how you developed your love of music, which I know was pretty far ranging. So tell us all about it. Okay, well, for that purpose, I have to go back to college in my second year at Rutgers. I took music appreciation. And when people ask me, what was the best thing you ever got out of college? I say it was the course I took at Rutgers in music appreciation. Anyway, uh, what happened, I went in to resign that job that I had in high school uh, and through three years at Rutgers. And uh, the boss suggested that I quit college and come work for him full time. Well, at that point, I quit the job. And uh, I should mention that we had a dentist friend in Chicago who suggested that if I would switch from Rutgers to uh, University of Illinois in Champaign-Urbana and get good grades in my senior year, he could almost assure me that as a um, resident of Cook County, I could get into University of Illinois Medical School using his Chicago address. Uh, that's exactly what I did. And uh, I had a wonderful senior year at the University of Illinois, got good grades, uh, graduated, took a job, in uh, Tuscola, Illinois at a chemical plant. And one day I got uh, a letter in the mail, congratulations, you have been accepted to University of Illinois Medical School. Needless to say, that was one of the great uh, memorable days of my life. Um, when I was uh, at, um, in my senior year, my roommate, was a Greek fellow named Pericles Bazanis, who lived in Chicago, and he was very knowledgeable about music. And he would bring down tapes of operas, symphonies, all kinds of classical music. And at night, we would listen to a program from Chicago called Music Till Dawn on WBBM. And they would announce early in the evening, what was coming on later that evening. And we would set our alarm clock for an opera prise, highlights from La Boheme or uh, Rigoletto, I know that's your favorite, or Gilbert and Sullivan, or a, or a Beethoven symphony. And we would set the alarm and get up in the middle of the night and listen to those uh, broadcasts. Anyway, the next question was what I thought I'd stop. No, you had the next question is actually uh, gets into your love life. Uh, oh, now I, I know 
you 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 did not uh, you did not uh, let the ladies man in you come out until relatively late in your in your education experience, but uh, it was during your internship I think that you met Doreen. Right. And uh, but but before you and Doreen uh, acted upon that, you decided to fulfill your military obligation, and uh, you I believe you went to Korea, and. Uh, what I was wondering was it like Mash? Was it uh, that that uh, Madcap? You know, like uh, like on the show. Can you tell us about this important part of your life uh, as you transitioned out of medical school and uh, started your your uh, your relationship with Doreen? Okay. And military experience. Okay. Well, uh, medical school was uh, not that traumatic. Like uh, it was difficult. I worked all through medical school. Uh, as a uh, as a uh, surgical nurse taking night call, so when they called me for uh, emergency surgery at night, I slept through most of the lectures the next day. But anyway, I managed to graduate in the top quarter of my class, and I took an internship in Michigan at Wayne County General Hospital. One of the uh, doctors that I trained under as an intern happened to be Doreen's brother who introduced me to his sister. And uh, uh, needless to say, we fell in love and went together for the year of my internship. Uh, we made the, or I made the decision that um, rather than start a residency program and get called away for military duty in the middle of the residency, I would get the military out of the way. So of course I wanted, I volunteered uh, after medical school and uh, uh, wanted to go to Europe, to Germany probably. So they sent me to Korea. Actually I had a pretty good, good 13 months in Korea. Doreen and I kept uh, in constant uh, touch by mail and decided that when my duty was finished in Korea, I would uh, meet her in Paris and we would get married in Paris. Little did I know, or little did we know, that two American citizens could not get married in Paris without posting bans for two weeks. Well, I did not have two weeks to spare. We found out that we could get married in Bern, Switzerland. I had uh, purchased a car while I was still in Korea. It was delivered to me in Paris, a little Renault Dauphine. We hopped in the Renault. Doreen wants to mention it had a sunroof. We loved that little car. We drove to Bern, got married, in the uh, German uh, civil hall, civic hall uh, with a German um, marriage, marriage certificate. certificate. And then we drove to uh, Oberammergau, a little town uh, in Bavaria, Germany, near Munich. And we were married there on a military post by a Jewish chaplain. So we had both a Jewish marriage certificate and a German marriage certificate. We spent the rest of the time touring Europe as our honeymoon and left, uh, flew from Frankfurt, Germany to our new post, which was in New York City and Governor's Island at Fort J, First Army Headquarters. At that, I better stop and ask you for the next question. Okay, so as uh, it's it's time to go over the net now and uh, and give uh, Jennifer and Susan a, a little more time to to get their, her story. Okay. Susan, please tell us how you became a humanist. Ah, that's easy. I always was, I just didn't know. <laughs> um, 
it started when I was working with Gene Roddenberry and um, Isaac Asimov, as some of you may know, who was a prolific science, science fiction writer, as well as nonfiction, sent a copy of his book, Asimov's Guide to the Bible, to Gene. And I snuck a peek at it and I started reading it and I, I knew that Isaac at that time was the president of the American Humanist Association. Uh, and so putting two and two together, I decided I wanted to explore after looking through his book and seeing, you know, all the sense that was in it, that I wanted to explore what is humanism and, and um, you know, because I had not really heard that there was such an organization. So I read up about it. I don't think we had internet at that time, but I think I went on, uh, sent away for some literature or read some literature and discovered that this was exactly how I felt. And it, it just lined up perfectly with, with my belief system. Jean was invited to give uh, an award and, and or I can't remember if he was receiving an award or giving an award, but we went to a humanist convention in Orlando, Florida, uh, back in, I think it was about the middle eighties. I don't, I don't have the exact date, it's in my book, but, um, Ted Turner was receiving an award there. And um, I think Gene was either receiving an award or just um, was there, you know, for the fun of it. Uh, Randy was there, the amazing Randy. It was, it was really quite a, a neat convention. And um, I, I just, I learned a lot more about humanism and I just knew that this was in line with my worldview. And so I became a humanist. Wow. A lot of people say that, 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 they realized they were always a humanist and just didn't know it. Right, right. All didn't right. have a name for it. I didn't understand right. that there actually was a name for, for this particular philosophy. And, and uh, it was nice to find out that there was and that there were, there were organizations that supported this and, and, mm -hmm. uh, and I became a big part of it. Mm -hmm. And um, you used to, uh, teach a course right the humanism humanism and star trek mm. something like it's that. not it's, it's not a course um i do a, a talk okay. and i've mm -hmm. done it in various places around the country it's humanism in star trek um humanism and the philosophy of gene roddenberry yes ron mm -hmm. ron's waving about something i don't know he's shaking his head um i've given it a couple of times at hsgp and in fact i'm doing a zoom on uh, Tuesday afternoon with a group of um, humanists in Hartford, Connecticut. Uh, and it's a PowerPoint presentation. So it's gonna be fun doing Zoom and PowerPoint together. Um, and I've um, you know, gotten a lot of, uh, got to meet a lot of people around the country in, in various cities. Um, I think it's about time for another one at uh, Humanist Society or they want to see the same old, same old. I mean, I haven't really updated the talk yet, but I suppose I could. But it's been. It, oh, that last one was a while ago, though. Yeah, but it's still the, okay. Well, maybe we have new members. A lot of new people who won't be bored seeing the same thing again and again. Okay. I want to track these here. I can do it. Sure, I would rather do it in person because then I. Well, yeah, it shouldn't bring be my too books long. along, and I'm sorry. It shouldn't be too long before we can do that. Good. I mm -hmm. hope so. Yeah. All right, the next question. What made you decide to move to Arizona? How and when did you become involved with HSGP and what was it like then? Okay, so um, there was an earthquake in Cali Southern California in 1994. It was yeah, called- we the were there. Huh? <laughs> we, we were there? We were there, yeah. Oh yeah, it was called the Northridge earthquake. Mm -hmm. um, it was very scary mm -hmm. and I was not employed as such I was writing and I decided that I don't like earthquakes and so I actually wrote to the U.S. Geological Survey and got a map of all the places that are safe from earthquakes so to speak in the southwest um, and the Phoenix area came up as pretty high on the list there are really no serious earthquakes here we did have one recently I think it was up up the road at Camp Verde or somewhere, but it, it's nothing. And I was really very earthquake phobic. And so I decided, okay, Arizona's warm, California's warm, um, Arizona's right near California. I can visit my friends. I can write from anywhere. 
I'm moving to Arizona. And I checked it out. I went to Tucson. I didn't really find a kind of place that I felt would be my home, but I came back up here, uh, looked around and um, discovered that I liked Scottsdale a lot. And you, at that time, when I sold my house, <clears throat> excuse me, in California, I got about twice as much property for what I, I'd had. The, the rates here were, were much better, the, the real estate market. And I moved here. And then when I moved here, I didn't know a soul except for my real estate agent and, and one person that I had known through Star Trek. And so I decided that I would uh, look around and see. Well, first first thing I did was I, I went to a meeting of the um, Jewish Humanist Society um, locally. Well, actually, no, I went to HSGP first. Mm-hmm. And it was Helen Goldsmith, who was the ersatz leader, who said, um, you know, you might want to check out the Jewish humanists because you're Jewish and you're a humanist. So that made sense. Um, I discovered that I wasn't that into my Jewish background and I wanted a broader perspective. And, and so I decided that HSGP was really more to my, my needs. And, um, you know, I still, I still liked the other group. I, I'm still in touch with many of the people from there, but I, I put my uh, interests and my um, energy into HSGP. And uh, that's how I ended up at HSGP. So I think that answers the question. I hope it does. Yeah. Well, what, was, what was it like then when you joined? Oh, when I joined HSGP, I think there were um, 25 people attending. I don't, I'm not even sure they were quote unquote members. Um, and we were meeting at the Safari Hotel, which has now been torn down, of course, and replaced with, I don't know what, condos or something. It was across from the, uh, what is that called? The Scottsdale Fashion Square. Oh, yeah. And um, there was a restaurant there called the Brown Derby. I don't think it had any relationship to the Brown Derby in Hollywood, but it was a cool name anyway. And so we would meet there. And, and um, I think breakfast was, was $4. And you know, they brought out a bunch of pastries and coffee. And um, uh, we started... Um, expanding a little bit we, we started having a board we, we had never had a board before and uh, so the next thing we knew um, I could take notes so they made me the secretary and <laughs> it kind of, I kind of moved up from there but um, you know we had interesting speakers and that was that was about it that was all we did we met every two Sundays every other Sunday um, and then it started to grow a little bit and so we hit the road I have a long list of about 20 people places that we met at before we ended up with our own building. We're going to get to that later, I think. Yeah. Okay. Well, okay. thank you, Susan. And let's go back to the night and Hal. Okay. Sure. Okay, Hal. Uh, we've gotten you and Doreen to New York, to Governor's Island. And so you, you had uh, some time uh, in close proximity to the Big Apple and all its uh, attractions and charms. Could you talk a little bit about that period? Yeah, uh, sure. Uh, it was a very uh, wonderful, first of all, we were newlyweds uh, and uh, we uh, were both in love with uh, Broadway, with uh, what Manhattan had to offer. So we went to Broadway shows very often, especially since it was usually free with free tickets from the USO. Anyway, uh, Doreen was pregnant dur- during that entire year. And interestingly, the day that I was discharged from the army was the day my son Aaron was born on Fort J. Doreen gave birth to Aaron that day. Uh, the, the next uh, step in our life, during that year that uh, we were at Fort J., I got a uh, dermatology residency in Philadelphia. So I immediately, after discharge, went down to the Philadelphia area to look for a place to live. We wound up buying a little house in Willingboro, New Jersey. Formerly it was called Levittown, but they changed the name to Willingboro. And we spent four years there, uh, three years as a resident 
at the Temple Skin and Cancer Hospital. In the fourth year, I was a research fellow in mycology. It was while we were there that we decided on an opportunity to join the Wheeling Clinic in Wheeling, West Virginia, uh, where we were welcomed with very open arms by the medical community, by the Wheeling Clinic, and by the Jewish community. Uh, what was the next part of the question? Well, we, we hadn't quite made it. I was, I was wanting to hear a little bit more detail about your time uh, in New York, but that's fine. Uh, the, how big was Wheeling, by the way, when you, when you moved there? It was a town of about 50,000 people. It had, it had a Jewish synagogue, a Jewish uh, temple, and there was a, a temple in, uh, across the river in Ohio. Uh, so there were basically three Jewish uh, communities. And uh, we, we became very active in that. Um, in fact, after about a year or two, I became president of the Jewish synagogue. When the synagogue merged with the temple a few years later, I became president of the temple. So I was president of two congregations and was very active in the Jewish community. I also, in addition to practicing dermatology, became president of the Wheeling Symphony. So we were very, uh, very active in all aspects of life in Wheeling, West Virginia. While we were still in uh, New Jersey though, uh, we had our second son, Bennett. Uh, Bennett is now a lawyer, but he's very uh, musical. And uh, he actually led the Wheeling Symphony in a summer concert one year. But I'm, di I'm di diverting from your- uh, Oh, that's good. That's what, that's, that's what I wanted to hear. Uh, no. Did you ever play a musical instrument, No. No, I took piano lessons uh, uh, while, as an adult and gave it up. It was too stressful. So no, I never, uh, my musical instrument was always the radio and the phonograph. I never played mm -hmm. an instrument. Yeah, you, you, uh, you share a love of uh, early American popular music with many of us. Can you tell us how you came uh, to that? Yeah, uh, during all those seven years of working at Standard Style Company in the stock room, I always had a radio on and it was always programmed to popular music stations. I very quickly learned who the great uh, singers and instrumentalists were. And I learned all the songs. I knew all the lyrics to all the popular music. And it became a very significant part of my life. That was before still rock and roll. It still is. Yeah, it is. But that was before rock and roll, wasn't it? Yeah, it was. And I never really got involved with rock and roll or heavy metal or any uh, rap music, it all went by me. Uh, <laughs> I was devoted to the music of the 40s, 50s, and maybe a little bit in the 60s. Also show, show tunes. We were, Doreen and I both were very knowledgeable and very attached to show music. And Candy. Yeah. You might mention that. Doreen wants me to mention our favorite musical was Leonard Bernstein's Candide, not West Side Story, although we loved that too, but Candide was our favorite. Okay, we're gonna go back to Susan now, but when we come back, I wanna hear your story of how you uh, decided to move to Phoenix and what you did in order to uh, 
uh, sell your house in yeah. West oh, Virginia. Yeah. We'll, we'll get to that when, uh, okay. when we come back. Though. Susan, yeah. are you, you ready again? Okay, we're back. Okay. All right, Susan. I've heard you say that um, J.P. Wright, who we know as Jan, is your partner and your best friend. Mm -hmm. I know he went above and beyond for the Humanist Society and was right there with you all the time that you were president. When Zenaida and I joined HSGP, back when we were meeting at the Hometown Buffet in South Scottsdale, I remember that Jan was vice president and you and he would bring your van loaded with heavy boxes full of meeting paraphernalia and a large lending library of books. I also remember that Jan took beautiful photographs. Um, did you meet him at HSGP? And can you talk about him back then and what your life together is like nowadays? Sure. Um, <laughs> yeah. I, uh, I met Jan at uh, the hometown buffet. He was one of the 25, I guess. And um, I was doing a book signing with one of my latest books about Hollywood or, or Oscars or something. And uh, he decided he was going to come to the book signing. And we really didn't know each other very well. But I left the book signing early because nobody showed up or there were a couple of people. And he said that he came later and I was gone. Uh -huh. But um, we became friends through HSGP and, and um, eventually I ended up being president. He was vice president. And yes, we schlepped the books about every week or every two weeks. We loaded up the van. They lived in my garage. It was our ever growing library. Uh, people contributed books. And so, you know, it started with one box. And then before we knew it, we had you know seven or eight boxes of books and all the paraphernalia and, and the, the uh, lectern and Everything had to be loaded into the van. We went to the hometown buffet, then we unloaded it. And even before the hometown buffet, there were um, bunches of other places such as uh, the Shalimar Country Club and the Marie Callender's on Dobson in Mesa, uh, the Country Harvest Buffet in Mesa, um, Old Town Hotel and Conference Center in Scottsdale. Anyway, there's a long, long list and uh, oh, and the Holiday Inn in Tempe. And we were, you know, schlepping, as I like to say, all of this paraphernalia around town for a long, long time. Um, and Jan was, um, we, we were not living together or anything. We were just really good friends. And so um, at that time, we had a lovely offer. And I'm way ahead of Hal here because he's still... Uh, back in New Jersey or, or <laughs> Wheeling, West Virginia, and he's about to move to Arizona. And I'm all about uh, moving onward. And Hal had come to one of our meetings at the place in Mesa. And he saw me with all the things and all you know, back and forth. And I think it was when we were at the Shalimar, he said, you know, we really ought to have a building of, of some sort. Um, I'm sure he'll tell the story better. But uh, where we can, you know, permanently have all of these things. And so we began looking. I'm going to leave it there because I'm getting way ahead of the story here. Well, actually, the next question is, can you tell us the story of how the Humanist Community Center came into being? Well, there goes Hal's thunder. Okay. <laughs> well, we, can, we, can start, we can start now, Jenny, and then come back to, to, okay. uh, to that question. Okay. Yeah, because I'm way ahead here. Okay. Okay. Hal, yeah, let's get you to Arizona first. Uh, you you uh, were retiring after a very successful career as a, as a, a medical dermatology specialist in Wheeling and a patron of the arts and a pillar of your community. Uh, you decided to retire to, to Arizona. And uh, before you left Wheeling, you of course had to uh, divest yourself of your, of your house. So what made you decide to come to Arizona and how did you unload your house? Okay, well, <clears throat> we had uh, attended several meetings, uh, dermatology meetings in Arizona, and uh, we, uh, and also in Florida and all around, and we decided that this was the place we'd like to retire to. So uh, while I was out playing tennis, Doreen went house shopping and uh, we bought a little house in Scottsdale 
Uh, I won't go into too much detail about that, but we enjoyed our first um, month here in that little house so much, we decided to go back to Wheeling and sell the house uh, that we had lived in for so many years. 30 years. And uh, so I, I know you wanted me to get into the poetry business. Uh, I've been writing poems since around the fourth grade in grammar school. I seem to have a knack for it. So when it came time to sell the house and put an ad in the Wheeling uh, newspaper, I decided to write a poem. And it was so successful that I put the ad in on Friday and the house sold the very next day for the asking price that we put in the paper. Anyway, this is the poem. Uh, let me, yeah, this is it. We're selling our home and we think you should check out Wheeling's best neighborhood. No realtors, please, because we feel we can offer the buyer a better deal. If you need bedrooms, we have five here at 6 Patricia Drive. As they say in real estate jargon, this dream house is a super bargain. To avoid any chance of disappointment, why not call us for an appointment? Well, they did. They came the next day and bought the house. Uh, they fell in love with it. And uh, the rest, uh, we came back to Arizona, decided that this little house was not adequate for us. So we bought our second house and uh, that was not a good location because Doreen was very much involved with the um, uh, art museum. And we relocated to our present home which happened to have a tennis court right across the street. And I wound up playing tennis three times a week until I finally had to give it up a few years ago for fear of falling on the court. Now, what did I leave out? Well, let me tell you what I'd like you to go back to. Uh, I know that uh, when you were in grade school writing poetry, uh, you made quite a splash with one of your teachers and you became yeah. kind of a... Uh, the, the poet laureate of your school. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Well, I think we were in the fourth grade and the assignment was to write a poem. So I wrote a poem and of course everything rhymed uh, like most of my poems do, all of my poems do. And uh, she was so excited about it. She insisted on taking me around to all the lower grade classes and read my poem. And she called my mother and had my mother come in to tell her that I had a very special talent. Well, I exploited that over the years. I wrote poems for every invitation, for every thank you note, for every trip we took. And for so many other instances, I can't remember them all. Uh, as you may recall, a few years ago, I put together some of my favorite poems in a in an, uh, collection that was called A Time to Rhyme, which we sold mostly to HSGP members. And the uh, income from that was donated to HSGP. Uh, some of you may still have A Time to Rhyme where I honored all my favorite uh, people that, uh, that I honored for their rot, such as uh, G.S. Gilbert of Gilbert and Sullivan and uh, many of the, uh, anyway, I, I don't wanna get into that because I know we're running short of time. No, we're, we're doing fine. 
Okay. Yeah, you, you. Uh, I remember that you used to open several of the HSGP meetings with uh, with a poem, and that, that was always a treat. But I do want to get through though to get you caught up with uh, with Susan. Is talk about your introduction to humanism and how you got into the humanist society. Okay. Well, uh, Doreen, I, I credited her with finding a, an ad in an announcement in the local paper that, Steve, that uh, Steve Benson was going to give a talk down in Mesa at a um, Marie Callender. Well, we were familiar with him and we knew he was entertaining. So we attended the talk, it was a breakfast meeting. And when he, he completed his presentation, the uh, meeting of the Humanist Society of Greater Phoenix came to order. Susan called the meeting to order. And she said, those of you who are not familiar with humanism, there's some literature on the back table. I went back and grabbed a sheet of paper that described the tenets of humanism. And I said, Doreen, this is what I've always believed in. And I joined the society immediately. Um, a few months after I attended a few meetings, I imposed on Doreen to come. She also joined and the rest is really history. We became very active in the Humanist Society and at Doreen's suggestion, we resigned from Temple High, which we belonged to for a couple of years. Ten. What? Ten. Ten, ten years. Ten years? Yeah. Anyway, we, we resigned and became very active members in the, the Humanist Society. Okay, so let's, uh, let's go back to Susan and get her version of how the Humanist Center came together. Okay, Jennifer, do you want me to just go on and talk about that? Mm -hmm. So, so Hal became, uh, who was Harold at the time, <laughs> even though, it, and your name sign says Harold, um, but uh, Hal became one of our most fervent members, very active, and he began to take pity on Jan and I because we were carrying around all this stuff <laughs> every time, and in and out of the building, and, in, and he said, you know, we really ought to have a place of our own, and I will put up I don't know if you want me to mention the amount or not, Hal. Well, the bulk of them, of the cost. He put up um, a good deal of what the building we ended up in cost, but we spent a lot of time trying to figure out where we were going to meet. Jan and I would go out scouting like on the weekends. We, um, we looked at an old, what was it? A Scientology building or something. No, and we, no. yeah, and we looked at, um, oh gosh, some houses and um, we talked about they were small so we could maybe put people in one of the bedrooms with a, a TV and they could watch the meeting from the other room. And then we looked at some empty land and we could maybe build our own place, but nothing was working out. Nothing seemed right. I was looking at the ads every week in the, uh, the shoppers, the throwaway papers. And there was one place listed in Mesa that you know, described, it was in the right price range and it described it as a, as a house. And I thought, well, you know, we'll take another look, another house, what, what we got to lose. We drove, Jen and I drove down there. We saw a truck parked in the driveway and, and it looked like somebody was living there and I didn't want to stop. He said, oh, let's just stop. Let's just look in. And we did. And it turned out that they had parked the truck there to keep intruders away. Um, which we were, <laughs> not really, but we peeked in the windows and we could see that they were doing some work in there. A couple of walls had been torn out or something. Nobody was really living there. And I think it was owned by a trust. Uh, and so, you know, we kind of liked this place. It looked like it had potential. There was a little garage converted in the back that had storage in it. And it was, um, you know, from what we could see, we just looked in the windows. I mean, and, and there wasn't a lot there. It, it's, it 
in no way resembles, well, a little bit, but what we have today. Um, and so we, we um, proposed this, we went out, um, Hal looked, uh, and we decided to get this, which we were able to do. I think we came up a little bit short. I think I kicked in some money, some other people did, but it was just enough to buy the place, not enough to finish it. It was still not what we needed for our meetings. And so this would have been back around 2003, I think, or 2005, maybe we closed on it in 2005, that was it. Five years later, as you said at the beginning of this presentation, we were able to hold our very first meeting. It took that long. We, we spent weekends. We had all the members volunteering uh, to come out on weekends. We ripped out walls. We ripped out plumbing. We ripped, pretty much took it down to the bones, um, the good bones that it had. And uh, Shelly came along and Shelly had experience in engineering and she was able to i mean we had Anne, Anne marie eisentrout was very helpful in getting us approval with the city um and i've probably taken up enough of my time here but i just want to emphasize how how we really it, it was three people who were really um influential hal of course with his his more than generous donation jan otherwise known as jb wright jan who helped us tremendously, helped me. I couldn't have done this at, at all without his help and myself. And then of course, all the volunteers who put in all their time, but it was, it was this core group that really helped us get started and, um, and all the wonderful volunteers that we had. Yeah, it's the first uh, event we had in the building was uh, 2010, the solstice, solstice party. winter solstice party. So for, that'll be our 10th anniversary being in the building, solstice of this year. Yeah. 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 Sorry, do you remember we had a pre-opening event while the building was still uh, gutted on the inside before the, the, the build the pony. Up. Yeah. It was a pony. <laughs> That's right. Oh, the pony, yeah. because, because Anne Marie's um, daughter was a child at the time, and I think she wanted to have pony rides <laughs> for the children. <laughs> <laughs> that was that was at least a year or so before we actually finished the building, right? I'm, I'm not sure. It was, a, I'm it was quite a while because we, we didn't have the, the big room built out yet. There was just right. empty space there. Right. And that had yeah. been the garage. And then, of course, that was added on to. Right. Um, mm -hmm. So, yeah, your pony. <laughs> okay. Let me let me ask Hal. Hal, uh, you obviously have have uh, been recognized as being a, a generous donor in most cases anonymously to a great many of the organizations, uh, humanist organizations by, by this time. And what, what made you decide to place such a big bet on, on a local entity? Well, uh, first of all, uh, we, we bonded, we bonded with the people mainly. Uh, we uh, developed a lot of close friends and there was something that we could get back on a regular basis. We had a vision of this house uh, community center uh, hosting. Back you the last question. What was that? I'm sorry, go ahead. Host, hosting many events, which it has done. In fact, uh, at the very beginning, uh, they mentioned the Spaghetti Monster Dinner and uh, all the other wonderful events that we've had over the years. Uh, Darwin Day uh, feast and so forth. But um, I was gonna mention that when we looked at that house, I was negative on it. I said, no, this needs too much work. We, uh, it, 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 it's, a, it's a dream, but it won't come true. Jan assured me that we could do most of the work ourselves. It turned out that wasn't exactly the case. <laughs> uh, at a meeting, I remember 
I don't know if it was me that got up or so, or the president at the time. No, you got up. I got up and, and said, said, I'll be dead and before. Said, no, be I, I said that um, we have to raise the money to get a contractor in here to put this place in the proper order. And uh, we, if we cannot raise the adequate amount of money, we should sell it and go on about our business. It was that desperate. Well, we all came through. People loaned us money. People gave us money. People gave us uh, interest-free loans. Uh, we managed to get it, scrape together enough money to hire a contractor. And he did a wonderful job. And- uh, Give Shelly some credit. Yeah, Shelly Newman was the one who said, we must get a contractor in here or forget it. We cannot develop this place on our own. And uh, anyway, the rest of this history, as you know. Okay. Yeah, I, would, I would just like to add though, that um, even though if I could just add- Sure. That, you know, Jan thought we could do it on our own. I'd like to at least thank all the people that did try to make that happen because we spent every weekend for like a couple of years. I mean, you know, we would go out and I know Al Wendler was there and, and just, yeah. you know, so many people were there and we all had different tasks. We pulled weeds, we, we, we uh, you know, did stuff on the exterior and the interior. As, as I said, we knocked down walls and we did the very best that was possible on our own. So, you know, Kudos to everybody who participated and helped. And yeah, we thought we could do it and we did our very best, but uh, it wasn't adequate. So we did what we had to do. We raised the money and, and as you mentioned, and we did get all those loans and everything, which was terrific. Yeah, you know, Susan, let me, let me just say one thing real quickly. Susan, I think one of the things, and it was like a, a, a virtue out of necessity that happened from, from all that period. Many of us who would not otherwise have gotten that deeply involved with a humanist center recognized that this was something that we all had to become a part of if it was going to be a reality. And that, that I think, turned us into a community almost more than anything else that could have happened before. We that's all a, decided yeah. hey, this is too valuable for us to not make it happen. So that's uh, a very go good point. And, and, you know, we, we didn't have to walk away, which is, you know, wonderful yeah. for us. Hooray for us. Okay. Jennifer, you want to close this out with uh, your part? Let me, let, me, let me just add one okay. more thing. A lot of us put blood, sweat, and tears into it. Mm -hmm. But I want to say that nobody did more to get this place going than the Pettigrews. I remember them coming out on a regular basis to flood the place so that the foliage wouldn't die. And uh, I just couldn't believe it. And they're still, they're still yeah. the backbone of the, of the organization. Yeah. They're still doing it. Uh, many, many people's names should be yeah. mentioned, but I just had to mention that. As I, as I, uh... Yeah, as I mentioned earlier, Hal, uh, we, Jennifer and I are going to try to get another I, uh, meeting like this with some of the other key players because I, we agree. Uh, we've seen so many people that have pulled so hard to, yeah. to make it happen and to keep it going. Right, right. Yeah, Jennifer. and even the, I mean, we, we really did need to get a contractor and that really was a, got us over the hump and able to, able to get it going. But even at, with the contractor, so many of us did a lot of work there, really built almost completely by volunteers, right. which is why it was taking so long. <laughs> but um, okay, Susan, did, is there anything else you wanna add about the, the, how the community center came to be? Um, no, I just wanna make sure that uh, all the people that participated get thanked yes. for all they did um yeah. and um let's uh I mean, it's amazing and, and and since we've had the building it's amazing how we've grown into having all of these various events i mean there's almost something going on 
uh, well, pre-COVID, but whatever, um, almost every evening there was something happening there and there's still a lot of things online. And mm -hmm. um, it's just amazing how, how much we have grown, how people have, have moved on from, you know, the small group that we started with to larger. And then it's so well organized. I mean, and, and Howard Johnson looks out for the building all the time. And I mean, just so many people are dedicated to to working and helping. It's it's just um, and, and we have an executive director. Um, it, it's just I'm thrilled the okay. way the group has grown. So yeah, we're all professional now. <laughs> That's great. Yeah. Um, I just want to mention that you're a humanist celebrant, and for almost twenty years, you've been presiding over weddings, funerals, and other life rituals, and that you're available for that and continue to do that. You recently married a, our Vice President Athena uh, Roberts and Paul Gibbons got married recently. Right. And you, you officiated there. So yep. if anybody's looking for for uh, you, we're, you're on our, you can you can be found on our website, get in contact with you with you if they people need that. And it's I think it's uh, wonderful that you joined the board of directors of the Humanist International, formerly IHEU. Uh, did a lot of international travel, yeah. meeting a lot of people, doing exciting work. Can you just tell us briefly about that? Oh, IHEU was a fabulous experience. Um, I was actually I was on the board of, of American Humanist Association, and Roy Speckhart knew they were looking for somebody, and he recommended me, and um, then I got to be on the international board and travel everywhere. Some of it I had to pay for, some of it they paid for, but it was a fabulous experience. We were in Norway and Belgium and Amsterdam and I mean, just all over Europe and um, <clears throat> London, of course, which is their headquarters. And uh, I wouldn't trade that experience for anything. It was terrific. And I got to meet people from all over the world, uh, people from India and Mexico. And, and we just, we have a wonderful international board um, so I was, I was thrilled to be able to do that and to be on the AHA board too. I was on that for 13 years. And that's wonderful. Can you tell us briefly, what is your hope for the future of HSGP? I think the future is, is that we're, we'll continue to grow. We'll probably outgrow this building, I'm sad to say, but um, you know, if we end up someday having 500 or a thousand members, who knows, um, we'll move on. We'll, we'll have uh, some future in, in some other building. And um, I would like to see humanism growing more and not being demonized by the right wing. Uh, and I think that we have our work cut out for us. We do have the Free Thought Equality uh, Caucus in the, in the Congress, which is wonderful. And, um, and Herb Silverman, whom I see sitting there, uh, hi, hi Herb. <laughs> Herb has been on, on the uh, AHA board and he's the founder of the Secular Coalition for America. Is that correct, Herb? No, that's correct. Yes. Oh, hi, Herb. Oh, hi. Herb is out in, in uh, South Carolina doing good things there. And, you know, I just, I wanna see the movement grow and, and be accepted and just, uh, more and more people involved. So, thank you, Susan. Back to you, Zenaido. Okay. You're on mute. <laughs> Oops. Okay, hell. Yeah. What I'm would you here. like to see as a future for HSGP? Well, the, for the future, I'd like to see us uh, uh, experience a growth spurt. Uh, like Susan and me, there are many people out there who are humanists and don't know it. They don't know it, uh, that there is a, an organization, that there is a movement, and that there is a philosophy of life that is consistent with their own. Uh, so I think their potential is there, and I'd like to see us outgrow the Humanist Community Center, which I understand is no longer the only uh, wholly owned one in the country, but we were the first. We got the ball rolling by buying and developing our own community.
community center. So yes, I'd like to see things continue to develop uh, after I'm long gone. Okay, well, thank you. Thank you both so much for what you've done and uh, what you continue to do for, for our community. And uh, thank you for sharing your stories and uh, essentially telling us all some of the high points of your lives because it was very interesting to, to all of us. Uh, so thanks for that. And indeed, like I said, Jennifer and I will make, uh, try to make good on our commitment to uh, highlight some of the contributions made by some of the people you mentioned as many as we can get uh, to talk about their key contributions because we know that they they did and do continue to support uh, the the center and have made it possible for all of us to enjoy it okay well thank everybody else for for coming in i would like to close out quickly uh, by noting that the COVID pandemic and its social and economic devastation has upended all our lives uh, many of us are struggling to make ends meet and to stay connected. Most critically, uh, we urge all of you to continue adhering to the masking, distancing, and isolation protocols to stay healthy. That's, that's the most critical message. The Human Society and other secular organizations around our state have adopted Zoom and other social media to keep our members and constituents informed uh, of the critical issues that uh, are impacting us all. We hope you're all tuning in and will continue to tune in. It's also a good time to remember that uh, never before, like never before, the Humanist Society needs your help to survive through this painful and tragic time. So if you can, please go to hsgp.org and help us remain viable so that we can be there when we all emerge from this as we surely will. Thank you all once again for tuning in. And thank you, thank you Zaino everybody. and Jennifer for this program. Thank you. Yes, thank you both. Al, thank you. It was an honor, thank you so much. No, oh, thank you. <laughs> Yeah, we, I, I learned so much about HSGP that I never knew. Uh, so thank you. I, I'm, I'm thrilled to be a part of this. This is great. Um, uh, we're going to go ahead and wrap this up. Uh, smash on the subscribe button, contribute to our Patreon, uh, or better yet, become a member of HSGP and get involved with this awesome group of human beings. Um, with that, we are out. Uh, be well and... Uh,